watch this. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last in our spring webinar series. I am Jill Escher, president of Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area, and welcome to Inside UC Davis Mind Institute Autism Research. I'm your host, along with uh, Christina Moretto, another member of our board. Christina, say hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I am uh, going to put this on full screen. Okay, here we go. Just to let you know, this is the seventh in our spring series, and our first six um, webinars are all archived at sfautismsociety.org slash webinars. And then we will take a break over summer, and we will be back in the fall with uh, a whole series devoted ex exclusively to the subject of dealing with severe behaviors. So look on our website and look in our newsletter and Facebook for news about that. Please note, um, if you can't see the presentation screen, sometimes it's hiding under your browser, so take a look. All of the attendees are on mute, so you can make all the noise you want and we will not hear you. Um, if you have questions for our presenters, we are going to try to take questions both right after their individual presentations and also at the end of the webinar. You can type into the question bar. Um, you'll see it in the control panel, kind of towards the bottom of your control panel. And Christina and I will be moderating those questions. If you're calling in and don't have access to the question bar, you can email us at info at sfautismsociety.org with your question. This uh, webinar is being recorded. That's always the number one question that we get. And it's unusually long. It will run for up to two hours. And that's because we have five incredibly fabulous presenters and couldn't do it in terribly short order. Um, just a little bit of background. The UC Davis Mind Institute is obviously associated with UC Davis and is located in Sacramento, California. It was founded by autism families as a collaborative international research and clinical center. And it has about, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, about four dozen labs um, associated with uh, the Mind Institute that really revolve around a variety of disciplines, um, genetics, environmental research, therapeutics, diagnostics, neurobiology, and more. Um, now, what we're looking at today is just a very small sliver of what's actually going on at UC Davis. If we were to do a whole UC Davis Mind Institute webinar, it would take days to do, I'm afraid. So we have five of those researchers here today. First up, we have Dr. David Amaral, who's the research director at MIND, and he will be talking about several uh, research projects going on there, and some of which you might want to get involved with as a research subject. He is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences. He is the past president of the International um, Society for Autism Research. He is the editor of a major autism research journal called Autism Research, and he's a member of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee um, out of the NIH. Christine Nordahl is Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and she's interested in understanding the neural basis for ASDs, and she'll, she'll be talking about her GAIN study, um, which deals with girls with autism, and as the mother of a girl with autism, I'm very interested in what she's doing. Uh, Herb Hertz Picciotto, is an epidemiologist who's very well known for her work looking at environmental factors that may increase the risk for autism. She's leading uh, two major studies, if not more, and she will be talking about environmental factors that contribute to ASD. Sally Rogers is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences who specializes in conducting developmental and treatment research into autism and other developmental disorders, and she will be discussing early intervention today. And finally, we will have Dr. Judy Vanderwater, who's Associate Director of MIND, and she wears many hats. Uh, she is uh, the Director for the Children's Environmental Health Center. She is a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, and she is known for her work in the immunobiology of autism. She'll be discussing biomarkers and how the gestational environment affects neurodevelopment. So with that, I am going to turn this over to our first speaker, Dr. David Amaral. So I just have to, hold on, click, I gotta get his slides up. 
Okay, Dr. Amaral. It's all yours. Hi, Jill, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us to be able to uh, do this session this, this morning, um, uh, presenting some of the research that's going on at the MIND Institute. And I want to thank Jill and the Autism Society of San Francisco Bay Area for giving us this opportunity to share with you some of our uh, research. As Jill said, the uh, MIND Institute was uh, established in 1998, and it was a parent initiative. Uh, there were four families, all who have ch children with autism, uh, who wanted to facilitate uh, research in, in autism, and they were particularly interested in facilitating research that had a biological and, and medical uh, flavor to it. Uh, they were convinced that um, that autism is a whole body uh, syndrome and that uh, we needed to use state-of-the-art uh, biological uh, strategies to understand the disorder with the ultimate goal of, uh, of being able to implement uh, new and innovative targeted treatments to re reduce disability of people on the autism spectrum. Um, Let's see. Um, so uh, we had uh, the groundbreaking of our building. Uh, here are the founding fathers uh, with their sons uh, doing at the groundbreaking in September of 2001. And uh, this is the building that ultimately uh, resulted. We have actually two buildings, one main uh, building that has our administrative and clinical facilities. And then we have a building right next door where we do our biological research. Um, we actually have uh, 57 faculty members uh, currently uh, conducting all forms of biomedical research. Uh, and as Jill said, uh, we have uh, um, uh, just a sampling of the work that's going on at the MIND Institute for you uh, today. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, three studies um, in my time. Uh, the first two are national studies that the MIND Institute uh, is participating in, and then uh, the third is uh, one that uh, we've been carrying out at the, at the MIND Institute since around 2005. The first study is one called uh, SPARC, and SPARC is an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Uh, Simons Foundation is a fairly large uh, private foundation based in uh, New York. Uh, and as one of their scientific initiatives, they have the uh, the SAFARI, which is Simon Foundation Autism Research Initiative. And uh, w because of the complexity of autism, uh, trying to understand it uh, really takes very large numbers of subjects. And one of the goals of the Simons Foundation is to understand all of the genetic uh, underpinnings of, of autism. Uh, and over the last decade, uh, people have done studies with um, you know, hundreds of subjects and then a few thousand of subjects. And what uh, scientists have realized is that in order to really get a full picture of the genetics of autism, it's going to take uh, a lot more subjects. So the, uh, the SPARC study has the ambition of collecting uh, DNA and uh, and some uh, clinical information on 50,000 individuals with autism and their families. And I wanted to uh, bring this uh, project to you because the MIND Institute is one of the 22 sites around the country that's participating in SPARC. Um, and this is actually uh, one of the the easiest and most innovative research projects uh, for families to get involved in. Uh, as you see on this slide, uh, if you, if you uh, link to the sparkforautism.org slash UCD, you will be able to register for this study. And then everything is actually done through the web or through the mail. So this is a study where families don't have to go to a clinical center. Uh, these are for uh, families who have one member that has a professional diagnosis of autism, but if that's the case, uh, you can join SPARC. And uh, there will be web-based questionnaires, and then uh, at, if, if all of the information that's provided to SPARC qualifies you for the study, uh, 
then you are sent a packet with, through the mail uh, that allows you to collect a, a saliva sample um, from uh, the, the family members uh, and then a uh, self-addressed um, uh, mailer that allows you to send the saliva sample back to the Simons Foundation. Uh, they then use that saliva sample to, uh, to determine uh, your, uh, to, to get DNA from the sample and then to do what's called hold exome sequencing. And that allows us to understand any mutations or, or changes in the DNA that might actually be relevant to autism, not only in your family, but in all of the 50,000 participating families. Uh, so again, this is an exciting project. Uh, UC Davis is the main site uh, on the West Coast uh, for all of Northern California and for uh, Oregon and Washington, Nevada. So uh, again, if you would like to join this study or get more information for this study, uh, please uh, go to sparkforautism.org slash UCD and you'll be able to get information and enroll if it seems uh, like you'd be interested in doing that. So that's a genetic study that the MIND Institute is involved in. Another study that we've helped design and um, and are currently one of seven sites around the country uh, is called the CAMP study. This is called, the CAMP stands for Children's Autism Metabolome Project. This is another study where we're looking at uh, components in, um, in, uh, in this case, we're taking blood samples uh, and we're trying to look at all of the uh, breakdown products uh, that are in the blood uh, that are associated with how the body is functioning. And one advantage to doing a metabolomic study is that whereas uh, the genetic study that is being done in uh, Spark can look at uh, your genes, uh, we know that in autism, more than just genes are, are causing, are increasing risk for, for autism, uh, or may even be causal for autism, there may be environmental factors. And by taking a blood sample and looking at metabolites in the blood sample, uh, we're able to um, to look not only at how your how the body uh, is normally functioning, but whether exposures to things like pesticides or other kinds of environmental toxins might be changing uh, a person's um, metabolic processing, how the body is functioning. So. The goal in this uh, study, the CAMP study, um, is to collect uh, blood samples from 1,500 uh, children nationwide, um, uh, at least 600 of children with autism. And the, really the goal is to try and determine a diagnostic uh, marker for autism. We don't expect that there will be one signal that will define everybody that has autism, but the beauty of metabolomics uh, is that we can s simply see every metabolite uh, that is being processed by the body. And what we expect is that there will be different groups of people with autism that might actually have alterations in their metabolism that would be uh, correlate, that would suggest that they have autism. And again, the goal would be to be able to use this kind of uh, uh, testing uh, on very young children. So this takes a very small amount of blood. Uh, and our, while this study right now is on children between 18 and 48 months who already have a diagnosis of autism, uh, that we would hope that further down the line, this same kind of technology would be able to be used for uh, newborn uh, children or children during the first year of life that may have some concerns for developmental disability. And again, the goal here is to have confidence earlier on uh, that a child may be at risk for autism in order to get them into the kind of early intervention that Dr. Rogers will be talking about uh, a little bit later. So this study is ongoing. We're in the first year of two years for this study. Uh, and uh, you can see that there is contact information in the bottom of, of this slide here. Again, there's a link uh, that you can uh, go to at the MIND Institute website to, uh, to get information and a contact number if you'd like to participate in this study. This study is uh, a little bit more complicated. Uh, the, the family does have to come to the MIND Institute. Um, 
we do a reconfirmation of the autism diagnosis with our clinicians here. We do some other uh, psychological testing and we have some questionnaires for the families. Uh, and we do then a, a blood draw on, on the child. Uh, but again, it, it's just one visit uh, to participate in the camp study. And uh, this study should be going on uh, probably for uh, one more year for us to reach our goal of 1,500 kids nationwide. Last study I wanted to talk about is one that we started in 2005 at the Mind Institute. This is an internal study that um, we realized that in order for us to understand uh, and ultimately to better treat autism, we somehow needed to deal with the incredible complexity uh, of autism. I think the field now knows that there are different causes of autism, there's different patterns of autism, and our expectation is not all people with autism are going to benefit from uh, the same treatments. And so our goal is to understand subtypes of autism, and um, a fancy word for subtype is phenome. So the Autism Phenome Project means Autism Subtype Project. And uh, again, we've been doing this study for uh, since 2005. Uh, you can read about this study, again, at our website. There's a link down below. And again, this study is ongoing. Uh, for this study, we're recruiting uh, children that are between uh, two and three and a half years of age uh, who either have a diagnosis of autism or uh, uh, children who are typically developing uh, because we, we also need to study and compare uh, children who are typically developing with those who have a diagnosis for autism for, to be able to evaluate changes. So the Autism Phenome Project is a fairly comprehensive project uh, and one of the advantages to families is uh, when they enroll in the Autism Phenome Project, uh, they are able to uh, have conversations with many of, of our experts here at the MIND Institute. Uh, we, uh, again, uh, have the children come in. We do a diagnostic confirmation uh, of the child. We do cognitive testing. Uh, we then do a, a, a medical exam. Uh, we do take some blood samples because we're looking at the genetics of, of children with autism. Uh, and we also do uh, both uh, MRIs and uh, EEGs. This is a longitudinal study, meaning that we ask once the parents uh, enroll their child in the study, when they're, again, the, at the first enrollment is between two and three and a half years of age, uh, but then we ask the families to come back annually uh, to uh, follow the development of the child, uh, because again, we know that autism changes over time. Uh, and many of the characteristics of autism you don't see when a child is two or three years old. You only see when they're uh, much older than that. And because the Autism Phenome Project has been going for some time, uh, the children are now coming back when they're in middle childhood, so between 8 and 12 years of age. We have about 415 uh, families that are involved. Uh, in the Autism Phenome Project, and again, we're continuing to uh, recruit uh, additional families uh, and uh, to particularly to enrich the Autism Phenome Project uh, it, with uh, uh, girls who have autism, and Dr. Nordahl will be talking about that in a moment. One of the things that we have been uh, doing is uh, to try and include uh, all children with autism. So many studies in the autism research field uh, capitalize on adults with autism or people who are higher functioning with autism. But the goal of the Autism Phenome Project is to uh, study all areas of the autism spectrum. Uh, so our, our subjects, have, there are very few uh, exclusion uh, criteria. We accept children who are nonverbal. We accept, uh, accept children who have uh, lower IQs. And what we've done over the years is just develop strategies to allow those children to participate in this project. So for example, when we do an MRI, you might ask, well, how do you get an, an MRI from a child that's two or three years of age? Uh, well, what we decided to do, we didn't want to do anesthesia of the children over and over again, so we developed strategies to be able to do our MRIs uh, at night when the children actually go to sleep. And so it takes a lot of patience, but you see here that our scanner uh, 
looks like this normally, sort of scary looking, but uh, what we do is sort of mask it and, and turn it into a child-friendly environment, uh, wait for the child to go to sleep, and the parents can do whatever they would normally do to get the child uh, to sleep, and then we can actually do scanning, and we are, are at about 90% success rate uh, with uh, scanning children as young as two years of age uh, at, in the scanner. And, and again, year after year, the, the families come back and we've been equally successful as the children get older. One of the things that we found, and I'm almost finished with my par part of the presentation, uh, is that there are different, uh, different kinds of alterations of brain development. Uh, one of the ones that we've really been focusing on is a subset of uh, boys with autism. Here's an example of where something is found in boys but not typically in girls. And these are boys that have an abnormally large brain for their, for their body size. Uh, and it's been known that some people with autism have rapid and abnormal brain growth early on. And We've studied this intensively. We now know that that's 15% of boys have this abnormal early development of the brain. But what we find is that their brain continues to be enlarged as they go into middle childhood. Because we have all the other information uh, of, uh, on these children who have the abnormally large brains, we can ask the question, are they any different from children who have autism but normal sized brains? And in this article that I, I'm picturing now, we actually uh, provided some of the answers to that question. And what we find is that uh, the children with the large brains actually have the poorest prognosis of all of the children on the autism spectrum. Uh, they tend to have less IQ gains over, over time. They tend to be more nonverbal. And even though they are getting just as much or even more treatment as the other children uh, in our study, uh, the kids with the big brains are really doing poorly. And what we're exciting, uh, excited about is that now that we've been able to define this type of autism, that is ch children with autism, boys with autism and large brains, we are going to start intensively studying uh, what their problems are, because at the moment we don't really understand what else we can do for these children, but by focusing on this phenotype, this subtype of autism, we believe that we're going to be able to understand better what their particular problems are and then and de develop uh, innovative treatments that will target those uh, specific problems. We have other uh, types of autism that we're working with and we're again excited that the next era of uh, work on the Autism Phenome Project will be developing specific treatments for specific subtypes of autism. So with that, I'm gonna, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, our next speaker, Christine Nordahl, uh, wrote a nice uh, commentary on uh, this uh, issue of uh, early brain enlargement and uh, how it defines one type of autism. And this was in a, um, a web-based journal called Spectrum. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I would recommend that you sign up for the news briefs from Spectrum because it provides an absolutely wonderful source of really excellent, high-quality information about autism spectrum disorder. So with that, I will close. And uh, with Jill, if we have any time, I'd be happy to answer questions. If not, we can Well, I'm going to squeeze in a, a quick comment uh, before moving on. Um, I did sign my both of my uh, children with autism up for the SPARC project. Great. And I did want to echo what you said. Um, it's incredibly easy to do. It's just a short series of questions online. And then you are emailed a box for each participant in the family. So you can sign up just your kids, or you can sign up your kids and yourself. You can sign up your typical kid and your autistic kid. You can sign up yourself and your spouse or partner, you know, the other biological parent, that is. Um, whatever combination you want. I know that Spark would prefer to have, you know, everybody sign up in the family if you can, um, but that's not always possible. Um, and all that part is very easy. The one part that is a little challenging, especially for those of us who have kids with more significant autism, um, is the getting them to spit in the tube. Um, so um, that was very limiting for us, but it's my understanding that the SPARC project will allow for blood draws down the line. So I'm yeah. hoping that we can still stay in the program even though my kids wouldn't spit. Um, it was easy for me. It only took me five minutes. But, um, 
uh, it kind of depends on the family. But I think I, I, I think anyone who can really should think about signing up for that. It really is that easy. Thank you. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And um, I have one of the kids, well, my son is one of the big brained kids who is in fact doing quite poorly. And uh, I, I am very, very interested in what you guys are doing on that. So thank you for your contributions there. I am going to, with that, um, I, we have, oh, well, now we have questions. Now we have questions coming in. Okay, I'm going to sneak in a quick question. Okay. Um, okay, what question is, is, is having a big brain essentially equivalent to having a big head circumference? Ask this mother. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And in really young children, uh, it's, it's basically the same thing. So, um, uh, in, in fact, uh, physicians often uh, are concerned if the head grows too rapidly early on, and uh, that's, that's why sometimes they'll have families go in and, and have that checked out because they're worried about um, a, a disorder called hydrocephalus where there's too much water in the brain. Uh, but basically speaking, yes, if your head is uh, really large, uh, then it's probably because your brain is really large. Interestingly, in, in typically developing people, having a bigger brain uh, is usually a good thing. Uh, having a bigger brain is usually correlated with having higher IQ. But what we found in our Autism Phenome Project is for the kids with autism, having a bigger brain is not associated with higher IQ. If anything, it's associated with lower IQ. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much. And we will get to other questions later, okay, everyone? So hold on, and we are going to turn it over to Dr. Nordahl now. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you so much for hosting this webinar and for inviting me to speak today. Um, the topic I'm going to talk about is the neurobiology of sex differences in autism spectrum disorder. And later on, I'll be telling you about uh, the ongoing study we have at the Mind Institute called the GAIN study, which focuses on girls with autism and using MRI to look at their neurodevelopment. But first, a little background on sex differences in autism. So across all of the autism research literature, one of the most consistent findings over time is that there is this sex difference in the prevalence rate of autism. Um, here is just a chart showing you that even from the year 2000 to 2008, as the overall prevalence of autism was increasing in children, more children were being diagnosed with autism, that the sex ratio remained relatively constant at about four boys being diagnosed with autism for every one girl. And of course, the big question here is why? Why is this happening? Why are there fewer girls being diagnosed with autism? And today I'm going to talk to you about two prevailing theories, one behavioral and one biological. That are, there's evidence for both of these theories. They're not mutually exclusive. And both are trying to answer the question of why there are fewer girls diagnosed with autism. So the first theory is really, um, lies on the diagnostic criteria and assessments for autism and this idea that girls are sort of flying under the radar or they're being under or misdiagnosed somehow, missed by the clinicians, missed by parents. The other uh, theory that I'm going to talk about today is a biological one, uh, suggesting that there are protective factors in females, uh, protecting them actually from getting autism, and this is called the female protective effect. But first, going back to the behavioral theory that perhaps girls with autism are flying under the radar, and this could be due to some sort of gender bias in how we're diagnosing autism today. The study I want to highlight here is called How Different Are Girls and Boys Above and Below the Diagnostic Threshold for Autism Spectrum Disorder? In this study, the researchers looked at 15,000 twin pairs in the general community. Of those twin pairs, each parent filled out a report of their child's autism traits at the age of eight. Parents were also asked if children had a clinical diagnosis, a formal clinical diagnosis of autism. They took those results and they divided the children into two groups. One group had the parent report of high autism traits. In this group, both of these groups had both boys and girls in them. So these children in the first group had high autism traits but didn't have a clinical diagnosis of autism. They also looked at a group who had equally high autism traits as rated by their parents, but they did have a formal clinical diagnosis. <clears throat> and then they compared boys and girls across those two groups. And what they found was that girls who had a formal clinical diagnosis of autism, in addition to having the I autism traits as rated by their parents, they tended to have higher levels of intellectual disability or other behavioral problems 
problems as compared to the girls who just had high autism traits but no clinical diagnosis. And so this le really leads you to think that there may be some gender bias in how girls are being diagnosed with autism. It could be that girls are less likely to receive a diagnosis of autism despite having high autism traits, but they aren't brought to a clinician for a diagnosis unless there are additional problems like intellectual disability or other behavioral problems. Another idea dealing with this idea of why there might be fewer girls diagnosed with autism is this notion of camouflaging or females with autism somehow learning to mask their difficulties. And the study I want to highlight here is called a behavioral comparison of male and female adults with high functioning autism spectrum conditions. In this study, the group looked at adult males and females with autism and they did two things. They did a clinical observation of their in a standard clinical assessment and then they also looked at a self-report of individuals reporting on their own levels of symptom severity. And interestingly what they found was that in that direct clinical observation of autism traits they found that females exhibited less severe social communication deficits than males. So females looked like they were doing better. However, on looking at the self-report of autistic traits, females rated themselves as being more severely impaired than the males did. And what this suggests is that females perhaps are better at adapting or compensating in these clinical environments when other people are watching them, this idea that they're camouflaging or masking their social deficits in a way that is leading them to fly under this radar of not being picked up for autism. And this is important because there's now research showing that as girls grow older, um, adult females tend to have more problems, additional problems with mood disorders such as depression or anxiety, and this could be a uh, direct consequence of spending their entire lives trying to mask their social deficits. So now moving over to the biological side of things, I want to talk to you about the female protective effect. And this is a biological theory based on genetics really that um, is depicted by this complicated model called a multifactorial viability threshold model. I like to think of it in a more simple analogy and I'm going to illustrate this with help from pictures that my daughter actually drew for, for this webinar. Um, so we like to think about it in terms of everybody having some sort of etiologic load or some sort of burden um, and then also some sort of threshold that once you cross that threshold you receive a diagnosis of autism. So we're here we have depicted a little boy and his load is depicted as a pile of rocks. Basically you can think about this pile of rocks, each rock being some sort of etiologic factor. Maybe it's a genetic mutation, maybe it's an environmental risk factor. And most boys can go around carrying their pile of rocks just fine. However, at some point when that burden becomes too high, when there are too many rocks for that boy to handle, he crosses this threshold and gets a diagnosis of autism. So now in thinking about what might be protecting girls from having autism, you can think about a girl as having a protective effect in this illustration, their baskets. So this girl can actually carry more of that etiologic burden. She can carry more genetic hits, more environmental risk factors before that burden becomes too heavy for her and she crosses that threshold uh, to the diagnosis of autism. So this is what we think about uh, when we talk about the female protective effect. There may be some sort of protective fact factor these baskets and we right now don't know what that protective factor is but there is recent genetic evidence suggesting that that girls do indeed have a heavier burden of genetic mutations and so recently there have been several studies published comparing boys and girls with autism uh, looking at their genetic mutations and what's been found is that females with autism have more frequent and more extensive uh, genetic mutations, a type of genetic mutation that's de novo, meaning it's not inherited from your parents. Um, it's a genetic mutation called a copy number variant. Females actually have more frequent and more extensive copy number variant mutations than males with autism. And what we know is that many of these genes are involved in brain development and synapse formation in some way. So a logical extension of this theory is that perhaps girls have an increased neuropathologic load as well. That is, girls have uh, a different 
or more extreme pattern of brain alterations than do boys? And that's really one of the driving questions that I'm trying to answer in my research program. And of course, the overarching goal of everything is that if we can understand where these neurobiological differences are between boys and girls in autism, not only will we have a better understanding of the etiology, which is perhaps different in boys and girls with autism, but understanding these differences could also lead us to develop more effective and individualized treatments and interventions for boys and girls with autism. So as David mentioned before, we use MRI as a tool to study the brain. And when I started this study, uh, we really didn't know very much about what was going on in the brain of girls with autism. And when I did a survey of the literature, it became very clear to me that we just need more girls to participate in MRI research studies of autism. Most of the research samples reflect this male dominance in, the, in how many males there are versus females with autism. And when we did our survey, it was even worse than the four to one ratio. We found that females with autism accounted for only about 10% of research participants in MRI studies. This was a survey we did that went up to about 2015. In more recent years, there have been more focus on looking at females with autism. Um, but the, the vast majority of studies have underrepresented females in their research studies. And what was pretty shocking to me was that the average sample size of females with autism was about five in each of these research studies, whereas the average sample size of boys was maybe dozens, 30 or 40 boys with autism. Uh, we only had five girls with autism, and of course that's not enough to really get a full understanding of what might be different in boys and girls with autism. So that's pretty much when the GAIN study was born. Again, GAIN stands for Girls with Autism Imaging of Neurodevelopment. And as Dr. Amaral mentioned before, we've had this long uh, going project at the MIND Institute called the Autism Phenome Project, starting back in 2005. And the main goal of that project was to look at biological phenotypes of autism, where you can think of sex, male or female, as a biological phenotype. But when we were doing the analyses, um, Although our sample size was rather large, you can see we had 155 boys with autism in our sample, and we had a 34 girls with autism, which pretty much reflects to four, the four to one ratio of what you would expect. Um, Although this 34 was more than the average sample size of five girls with autism, it still really was very unbalanced. We had many more boys, and it became really clear to me that we needed to have a study where we could specifically target girls with autism uh, to, to balance out these sample sizes. So the goal of the GAIN study is to recruit an additional 90 girls with autism and 30 control females who have typical development. And the total numbers of what we're aiming for, you can see, are more balanced across the sexes. And then we can do really full and comprehensive evaluations of what's different between the neurobiology of boys and girls with autism. As Dr. Amaral mentioned before, uh, we are looking at very young children with autism, two to three and a half years of age at recruitment. And that's important because when we're looking at a neural basis study, because we want to take a snapshot of the brain and look at how it's developing as close in time as possible to when the child is diagnosed, um, not many, many years later, after all of the compensation and adaptation and, and intervention effects of happening, we're thinking that if we look at autism for the neural basis of autism close in time to the diagnosis, we get a more clear view of what the alterations are that are specifically related to autism. So as Dr. Amaral mentioned, we do our MRI scans without the use of any sedation or anesthesia. We do all of our scanning during natural sleep. I work closely with all of the families to develop individualized strategies for the children um, to have them go to sleep at the MRI scanner. We give them practice kits so they can send to go home and practice with headphones and earplugs ahead of the scan. And we stay with the children during the entire duration of the scan, watching them very closely in case they wake up. We also invite the parents to stay in the MRI room with them in case their child wakes up. And after about maybe 30 minutes of scanning, it could be five hours of waiting for a child to fall asleep, but after about 30 minutes of scanning, we get really beautiful pictures of the brain. So let me tell you a little bit about how we evaluate brain structure and connectivity using these images. 
Um, one thing that we can do is volumetric analyses. We can actually take an MRI scan and we can parcelate that MRI scan into many, many different neuroanatomical brain regions and then simply measure how big each of these brain regions are. We can also look at things called, measurements called uh, cortical thickness and surface area. So here, the cortical surface is this gray matter here, the gray cortical ribbon where the, the cell bodies, the neurons actually live. And we can look at how thick this is. We can parcelate the surface into different gyri and sulci and look at the surface area of, of the cortex as well. In addition, from this one MRI scan, we can look at the cortical folding patterns. So each of us has a folding pattern that's unique to our individual anatomy, and what we found is that there are actually differences between how the brain is folded in individuals with autism versus individuals without. Um, so here are some preliminary findings from the GAIN study, and the, the main take-home message here is that boys and girls with autism are different. So here we compared cortical surface area uh, looking at the first comparison was females with autism um, versus female control participants. And you can see that here is a pattern of brain regions that are different between these two groups. In another comparison, we looked at boys. We looked at males with autism versus male control. And again, we saw a pattern of, of brain differences between these two groups. Multiple regions and frontal and temporal regions, with both, which both make sense as far as uh, relating to autism behaviors. But what was really striking to me was there was absolutely no overlap in the pattern of brain regions identified in males and females, really suggesting to me that there's something different going on in, boy, in the neurobiology of boys and girls with autism, and we really can't just look at them as one entity of individuals with autism. We have to look at them separately as males with autism and females with autism. Another thing we can do in looking at the MRI scans is looking at brain connectivity. So here we're looking at how the neurons are communicating with each other and neural circuits within the brain. Uh, one thing we can do is look at the white matter pathways in the brain. These are the structural pathways that connect different regions of the brain. Um, and we can also look at something called functional connectivity. And here we're looking at brain activation. So I told you that we do our MRI scans during natural sleep, but of course our brains are active all the time. And so we can look at brain activity even when children are sleeping. The measure of functional connectivity is basically, basically looking at correlated activity between two brain regions. So here is a time series of these two different brain regions depicted here. And you can see that the neurons are firing at exactly the same time. When that happens, we call these two regions functionally connected. And in this way, when looking across the entire brain, we can look at neural circuitry and how the, the, the brain is, is functioning in coordinated activity. Um, one of the studies, the first study that we published on sex differences was looking at a white matter structure called the corpus callosum. It's the largest fiber bundle in the brain. It connects the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. And very quickly, without going into all the details, we found a different pattern of uh, organization of the fibers in the corpus callosum. We found in boys there was a, a decrease in the fibers projecting to a region of the cortex called the orbital frontal cortex, which is involved in social behavior. In contrast, in females, what we found was not a decrease in the orbital frontal regions, but right adjacent to it, um, the anterior frontal fibers were diminished in girls with autism. And these are regions that are involved in higher order cognitive processes. And so we speculate that these differences in organization could be leading to the differences in the compensatory or, or ad adaptive features that females are showing in autism. They're using their cognition to sort of mask the social deficits. That's all very speculative at this point. Um, so our research studies are ongoing, but just to summarize what I've told you today, um, using our current diagnostic practices, there is the notion that some girls may be misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed, somehow flying under the radar of clinical diagnosis. I've talked to you also about the female protective effect and some of the genetic studies supporting this notion and then moving on from the genetic studies to looking at the neurobiology and how that might be different in girls with autism as well. We found that males and females in every place that we've looked have different patterns of brain alterations. And then moving forward as we um, 
look to future directions of our research, we absolutely need more females to be participating in research studies, uh, particularly MRI research studies, and then never losing sight of our goal that the, the reason why we want to look for the different underlying biology is because there could be sex-specific pharmacologic interventions or pharmacologic treatments or interventions that may be more or less effective in either boys or girls with autism. And so with that, I'll end with acknowledgments. It's taken a lot of people to do um, all of this research. And then uh, the GAIN study, I'll just say we are still recruiting girls with autism. If you know anybody or have a daughter yourself with autism, we would love to talk to you. Here's some information about the eligibility, um, what you can expect, and some contact information about the study. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Um, thank you so much. That's fascinating. And um, yeah, we, we're kind of out of time for questions now, oh, but if sorry. some come in later, we will definitely take those. Uh, just a quick comment. I have a, a daughter who's 11 with autism, um, but it sounds like she's uh, well too old to enroll in GAIN. Is there any other opportunity for her at the mind? Um, so we not, I can't think off the top of my head, I would look at the research page um, of all of the different studies, but moving forward, I'm actually really interested in trying to get at some of the older girls with autism as well. In the GAIN study, we're going to be following our girls as they grow older, hopefully as long as they'll let us follow them, um, but I do recognize that there are a lot of older girls already that, that we've missed, and I'm trying to think about ways that I can design studies to include more participation. Okay. So well, hopefully in the we'll future. In Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks so much for that. And now we're moving on to Dr. Hertz Picciotto, um, speaking to environmental contributions to autism. Are you there? Yeah. We don't Can hear you, hear you. Oh, now we hear you. Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Is my screen right, or should it I? It is. Okay. Good. Okay, so um, I'm really pleased to be here and thank you um, for inviting uh, all of us. Uh, and I have been looking at in the environmental contributions to, uh, to autism for uh, uh, almost 15 years now. And uh, I'm happy to, uh, how do I advance the slides? Um, how do I advance? I'm clicking on your screen. Uh, I'm doing the, the down button. It's um, not, not doing anything. Click on your screen with your yeah. mouse. Click I'm sorry? On your, click on, click your, on screen. your screen. Okay, I see. Thank you. All right, so the, um, let me just start by talking about the incidence of autism and the trends over time. <clears throat> we, uh, there was a, a, a seven-fold increase in the incidence of autism comparing 2001 births to 1990 births, so over an 11-year period. And <clears throat> we and others uh, looked at uh, whether there were diagnostic kinds of changes like the definitions and the criteria and the way in which uh, clinicians were practicing. Uh, and we found that about a half of the rise was explained by simply these changes. Uh, but the important part of that is that at least half of, uh, or you know, half or around that, of the cases of the rise uh, was not explained, and therefore uh, pro probably has some sort of origins in the environment in which we live, because genetics just doesn't change uh, that rapidly. Uh, let me explain a little bit about how I think about causation, and the uh, focus of my research has been on what I think of as the root causes for autism, which we can think of as being initiating. They occur before the onset of symptoms and certainly before a diagnosis is actually made. Uh, and these can be distinguished from what we might term the, the mitigating or exacerbating factors uh, that might operate more or less at any point in time, but certainly after uh, th that child has reached the threshold that uh, that, that uh, Dr. Nordahl spoke about just a few min minutes ago, uh, that there may be factors, and parents are 
constantly trying different things, different kinds of ritual, uh, you know, different kinds of ways of structuring the child's environment or uh, their diet and things like that, and that those factors might actually have impacts on uh, the severity or the kind of episodes of, of you know, really heightened um, heightened dis dis dysfunction and, and disabilities. And um, this, so it's possible that some of the same factors that are initial causes might also have impacts later on. So I think the research both has uh, impact, you know, uh, relevance for understanding <clears throat> what we can do in, in terms of prevention and reducing risks, as well as uh, improving outcomes for children who, who uh, do develop autism. We also think of, of causing, causation as being multifactorial, and that applies across the population where there could be multiple uh, different causes for different people, and uh, also within an individual where there may be multiple causes, and most likely are multiple causes, uh, that uh, combine together to finally be, you know, that load of rocks. That was, I love those pictures, Christine. Um, uh, that, that one is carrying and finally you sort of cross that threshold and, and, and it really is a full-fledged um, clinical syndrome. Uh, and here <clears throat> uh, we can think of that set of causes as being a set of sufficient causes, um, but most cases do not have a single cause. The vast, vast majority of cases do not. So we can think of these little sets of sufficient causes as these little pies, you know, many, many of them around the population. Also, a word about genetics. Uh, we definitely know that genetics plays a pretty substantial role. Um, the most recent estimates based on sort of the strongest and largest studies suggest about 50% heritability. Uh, and again, that it might be that many people have uh, one or two or a few genes that predispose them uh, and then in combination with some sort of in insults uh, prenatally and possibly postnatally as well, one uh, sort of pushes the limits of, of the adaptability of an individual. So about 15 years ago we started uh, a study called the Childhood Autism Risks from Genes in the Environment or CHARGE study in which we enrolled children from three groups, uh, autism spectrum disorder, other developmental delays, and typical development. And I won't go into a lot of detail about how we collect the data, um, but uh, I'll, I'll focus more on the results today and give you a little whirlwind tour. So um, these are four factors that I'm going to talk about um, in and, and provide you with some, some results, and then I'll refer to some of the other factors uh, at the end. So pesticides uh, are actually designed to uh, affect the brain, uh, and many pesticides were originally developed as nerve gases for warfare, uh, and, and the ways in which they act on the brain, uh, interestingly, are, are similar for uh, even insects as they are for people in terms of, of uh, the, the, at the molecular basis. And it's also important to think that uh, the vulnerability in utero is really extreme because the brain is growing at an incredibly rapid rate. On average, 250,000 new neurons are being formed every minute during gestation. And because most of that growth is actually happening towards the end of the gestation, uh, it could be half a million or a million um, uh, per minute in, in those last few months. Organophosphates are a class of, of, of uh, pesticides that are actually quite widely used and uh, this is a summary of studies that have either looked at symptoms uh, related to autism spectrum disorder or an actual diagnosis. So that first panel uh, shows there's two studies, one in a California a cohort of births uh, to farm, uh, in a farm worker community, and the other one was a New York City um, inner city cohort, and both of them found associations with symptoms of pervasive developmental uh, delay. And then uh, there are some other studies uh, shown here. The uh, middle two were both looking at uh, drift from agricultural applications of pesticides in California and linking addresses where uh, the mother lived 
uh, at the time of birth or during gestation to the, uh, the, 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 case, the diagnoses of autism um, identified through the developmental, California, developmental, uh, California Department of Developmental Services, the CDDS, uh, in the case of the Roberts study, and then the, in the charge study for uh, our study, which is um, highlighted in black. And all of the, and we found uh, for some of the pesticides, and particularly the organophosphates, uh, more than a twofold uh, higher risk depending on which trimester uh, they were exposed. Overall, about a 60% increased risk for. Uh, families that lived within about a mile of uh, those applications of organophosphates. Um, this slide actually shows uh, looking at a specific organophosphate known as chlorpyrifos and comparing uh, those with high versus low exposures in the prenatal period looking at certain brain regions and uh, the, the, these MRIs uh, actually revealed at ages eight to nine that the children um, with the high prenatal uh, exposure had changes uh, in certain areas of the brain that are responsible for language development, for attention, and for social uh, cognition and inhibitory control. Um, areas of behavior that are uh, are you know prominent in autistic behaviors. Um, and this is a study not of people with autism, but just showing this, uh, the, these, these brain changes related to the exposure. Chlorpyrifos, you may have heard about it in the news recently. Uh, this was scheduled and uh, to be banned. Uh, it's already been banned nationally for household products, and this was to sort of extend that ban to agriculture and other uses. Uh, but uh, despite earlier intentions uh, of, of the uh, previous leadership at the EPA, uh, that, uh, that plan was, was sacked, uh, at least uh, temporarily. It's a bit of a setback. Um, another uh, aspect of pesticides I wanted to say a few words about is we also looked at gene expression. We're beginning to extend our work from just identifying exposures to understanding mechanisms. And in this case, we looked at the pesticide exposures during gestation and gene expression in the child during participation in the charge study at two to five years of age. And what we found was that uh, there were uh, exposures to pesticides was associated with this differential expression of quite a few genes that were involved in immune responses. But this was only seen among the ASD children. Uh, this same uh, linkage was not seen in the typically developing children uh, or for that matter in the developmental delay group. So uh, it, it does look like there, there and there are possible, a number of possible explanations for this, but one possibility is that uh, there are some permanent changes uh, that influence uh, how those genes are expressed beginning in, in that prenatal period uh, as a result of, of pesticide exposures. I'm going to turn now to air pollution and just uh, really briefly point out that uh, much of the air pollution we live in today um, is from traffic. We found that living close to a freeway was associated with a higher risk of autism or also for developmental delay uh, compared to people who live further away. And also estimates of air pollution from all sources, uh, including industrial sources, for example, uh, were higher um, for the residences, um, in other words, in the, in the location where uh, mothers were living during the pregnancy uh, for cases as compared to controls. And so uh, there does seem to be some association uh, and that has now been replicated in quite a number of studies, uh, but not all. And um, uh, highlighting the last one was a study of uh, four European cities uh, in which they did not see this kind of association. But most of the studies are seeing some associations with air pollutants, albeit not necessarily the same pollutants from study to study. So, uh, but air pollution is a very complex mixture, and um, many of the constituents of air pollution have been associated with inflammation, with oxidative stress, which is kind of the stress that uh, happens at the molecular level in the cells and also 
endocrine disruption, uh, which of course is interesting from the perspective of, of, uh, of sex differences in, in autism. Turning to uh, maternal nutrition, one of the, uh, this is the only graph <laughs> I'm showing, uh, but it, what you see here is uh, uh, a graph of, of uh, cases versus controls in the charge study, cases with ASD, and looking at who took their prenatal supplements in the three months before pregnancy, that's B3 to B1 along the, the, the horizontal axis, and, uh, and then also for each month of pregnancy. And what we see is that there was a significant difference with the case mothers being less likely to take those prenatal supplements in the period right around conception, uh, before and uh, just after conception, so that autism risk was actually reduced 40% in the children whose mothers did take those supplements. Now, what the supplements contain is uh, folic acid as well as other B vitamins and also, uh, in some cases, iron. We know that folic acid is required for synthesis of DNA, also for repair and for methylation, and that prenatal supplementation, the reason it is recommended is because it does prevent about 50 to 70 percent of a certain kind of birth defect where the the primitive brain uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't form properly, called neural tube defects. And our results were actually replicated in a very large Norwegian study which found the exact same 40% reduction in risk for that time period. Uh, what hasn't been uh, replicated is that we also found, and, and it's because nobody seems to have looked, that those uh, mothers who have uh, who have inherited uh, mothers and children who have inherited genes that uh, that are that involve the uh, the metabolism of folic acid and that are inefficient in their use of the folic acid. They were the ones who were most at risk if they did not take the those prenatal supplements and got the most benefit when they did uh, take them. So there, there is this, this interaction with a susceptible subgroup in the population in which uh, genes and nutrition seem to be interacting. And then uh, last I want to talk about maternal uh, diabetes and uh, our results uh, have, and the results of quite a few other studies. So there was a, a, a pooled analysis in which a bunch of small studies were pooled together. The results were brought uh, into a met, what we call a meta-analysis and it showed that 50 to 75 percent risk of ASD was associated with having diabetes during pregnancy and in most cases it was gestational diabetes uh, but uh, also um, uh, underlying type 2 diabetes. Um, in, in the case of the charge study we included both but most of them were gestational diabetes. Um, we found an increased risk with one or more of uh, diabetes, obesity, or chronic hypertension uh, and we also saw an association with preeclampsia which is a pregnancy induced hypertension. Now um, some uh, very large studies now, four more studies have now replicated these findings uh, with really a tremendous amount of consistency and some of these studies had hundreds of thousands of people um, involved. Now um, diabetes of course is a, is a, is a, is a deficiency in um, a reaction to um, a, a hypersensitivity to insulin and dysregulation of glucose metabolism. Uh, of course uh, glucose is energy and, and the uh, fetal brain needs a lot of it. Uh, but we really don't know exactly what the mechanism is behind this. Um, however, I want to draw attention to some other time trends that seem to be running in parallel with the increases in autism spectrum disorder, uh, ADHD, mental health disorders, asthma, obesity, diabetes, autoimmune conditions. And uh, the, when we think about this kind of in a larger context, the question arises whether there might be some kind of a unifying explanation uh, that might link uh, these different very diverse types of conditions with some common upstream exposure or set of exposures um, or types of exposures. And uh, it, it's interesting to think that certain exposures might influence ASD and they might actually influence ASD through parental uh, diabetes or obesity. 
Um, or there could just be, uh, it, it could be a, a coincidence that these exposures are going up and these things are happening independently. Uh, but there, it does suggest that some of the mechanisms underlying um, these factors uh, are, are shared and might involve certain infl inflammatory kinds of pathways. So overall, when we think about environment, and of course we're, we're thinking about it very broadly, not just chemicals, also nutrition, also maternal health, mm -hmm. uh, but um, when we think about things that are uh, out there that could be regulated uh, better at, this, at the societal level, there are tens of thousands of chemicals, the vast majority have not been tested for neurodevelopmental toxicity and we know that pregnant women carry a, a, a pretty strong burden of those chemicals along with the rest of us. Uh, but the good news is that when we think about these, uh, these pies of sufficient causes with the multifactorial etiology, we don't really have to get rid of all of these causes. All it takes is getting rid of one of them, one wedge, and you no longer have a sufficient set. In other words, maybe the, there'd be some uh, impairments, but they would not be such that it would reach that threshold of, uh, a, a, of really a clinical, clinically confirmed kinds of uh, diagnosis. So, uh, and, and of course, probably tackling more than one might be you know, even better in terms of improving outcomes, but it's not as if we have to solve all of the environmental chemical problems because they do interface with each other. We recently found that the women who took their folic acid, su the prenatal supplements, actually were less influenced by pesticides um, than uh, those who did not. So these dependencies are really important. And um, then just uh, these are kind of take home messages from our and other studies. Uh, there is some suggestion that uh, spacing pregnancies further apart is better for the risk, uh, reduces risk for autism, um, uh, avoiding the flu and fever, which in many, in some studies has been associated with ASD, and uh, uh, besides the other ones I've talked about, uh, if you take SSRIs, you should discuss those risks with your doctor. Um, and we are now planning studies. We are in the process of getting ready to go into the field to actually follow up these children and see what kinds of early exposures influence their later outcomes, whether we see changes in diagnosis or severity, uh, any kinds of improvements, uh, and whether ADHD and some other uh, comorbidities start to develop uh, and become more prominent at, uh, at pre-adolescence and in adolescence. So many people were involved and particularly I need to acknowledge uh, our staff as well as all of the families who have been participating in these studies and our funders. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. hertz -Picciotto. Um Very interesting. Yeah, we are out of time again for questions. So uh, people, if you want to ask more questions, please type them into the question bar and uh, we will volley them at our presenters at the end of this session. Um, but I have so I personally have so many questions for you. I could go on for hours, um, but I, I unfortunately I will hold them until after our next two speakers. Uh, let's move on to Dr. Rogers. I am going to queue up your board. Hold on. There you go. All right. Okay, and our next speaker is Dr. Sally Rogers, speaking on early intervention. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here with my colleagues and with all of you today to talk about the kind of research that I carry out here at the Mind Institute and that I've been doing in the 15 years that I've been here. And um, I think to lead into this, you've heard a lot about the biology of autism. And I think for a long time there's been the hope that uh, biological treatment, medications for ASD would be a cheaper and faster and more effective route for treating the symptoms and the underlying causes of autism in people who have it than the interventions which we have, the behavioral interventions, which are quite effective in treating many of the symptoms of ASD in people across the age span and across the severity level. And I think people have thought that behavioral treatment is kind of a band-aid, well, you're just, cha you're just changing this kind of 
a kind of mildest layer of difference, which is behavior, and you're not really getting to any of the biological pieces of autism. And also people felt, well, behavioral intervention is so expensive, it takes so long, it's so complicated to carry out. Wouldn't it be nice if we just had a pillow? But I think now that you've been hearing some about the complexity of the biology of autism, from things that happen in grandparents and parents before children are ever conceived, exposures, hundreds to thousands of genes, all kinds of differences in the environment, in the gene pool, in the way the brain develops after the genes are there, in experiences and uh, exposures children have in pregnancy and after pregnancy illnesses. Um, you know, thinking about individually targeted medications doesn't, to me, seem easy. It seems complex to come up with the meds and expensive to develop them. And this is a long time process, I'm afraid. And on the other hand, as we think about early interventions, and, and we've learned more and more about what ba how babies learn and what happens to the brain of any of us when we are learning, it's clear that this is not just a surface change in behavior, that the learning process itself changes the way the brain is organized. It changes brain structure in that it fosters new synaptic uh, developments, new synaptic connections, new formations of connections across brain areas, as well as building neural networks that become more and more specialized for what we've learned. It has chemical effects on the brain. It has genetic effects in terms of gene expression. So learning is itself a biological process that has uh, many, many effects on the brain. And when we're targeting learning in a very specific area, like learning vocabulary or learning to throw a ball or learning how to shake someone's hand and develop eye contact, when we're teaching those skills directly, we are affecting the, the brain areas that are controlling those behaviors and that are interacting with the body to help those things happen. So, in fact, teaching is actually a very targeted intervention. And since we teach to each individual, I think of behavioral interventions as targeted individual interventions for specific profiles of specific people that are dealing exactly in the neural network that we need to be working in. So my argument in spending my life in early intervention is that this is, in fact, has the potential to be a very targeted, very effective intervention for each person. And as we get better and better at learning how to deliver these, they will be cheaper and faster and more effective. So um, that's why I've spent my life doing this kind of work. And one of the uh, things we have really learned as we've gotten better at earlier and earlier diagnosis is, as you know, babies are little learning machines. There's nothing that learns as fast as a baby brain. And that's true of babies who are going to develop autism as well as babies who aren't going to develop autism. And so, as if you know my work, you know that I've been working uh, to try to develop interventions younger and younger and younger so that we can harness this infant capacity to build social and language uh, skills and learning at the time when the brain is the most ready to do it by virtue of the youth of babies and also because that's what brains are doing in all children at those ages. So how do we harness that capacity in young children to maximize their social and language learning? And how much can children who have uh, needs or difficulties in these areas, how much can they accomplish? How far can they go? And then finally, how do we provide access to more children who need these kinds of interventions? Those, I think, are the three challenges that keep me moving in this area and keep us in my lab digging deeper and deeper into how to develop and deliver these interventions to the youngest children and parents. Um, not with the assumption that older children can't benefit greatly, they can from target interventions as well. But more just that there is something, um, I think that the earlier we are, the earlier we can uh, work with the, so the difficulties that autism raises without also dealing with all the byproducts, as Christine was talking about, about going through life without some core skills and therefore needing to 
do something different. So early in my career, there was a tremendous amount of uh, research which really turned the idea of how people with autism learn on its head. I think up until the 80s or 90s, we assumed that children with autism learned in very different ways and had to be taught in very different ways in order to learn. And a set of studies that started in the 80s and influenced me as a young psychologist just beginning in this field and then studies I carried out myself demonstrated that we were really wrong about this, that young children with autism follow very typical developmental courses inside specific areas of learning. Even in their most affected domains of learning, like language, like social behavior, like play, like pretend play, um, even in those areas, young children with ASD follow the sequences, uh, the landmarks, the milestones that young children without ASD follow as they acquire language, as they acquire play skills, as they acquire cognitive abilities, as they acquire motor skills. Uh, the difference is in the rate of development and in the relationships within some of these domains, but not in the domains itself. And this is really huge for early intervention because it means we can be thinking about adapting the curriculum that all young children are learning, the areas that they're all learning, the typical curriculum that preschoolers are learning in preschools, in church preschools, at home in the kinds of uh, materials that parents use that these can be fitted to young children with autism, that they can be learning what their peers learn. And if we teach them what their peers are learning, we both capitalize on their brain's readiness to learn those things and on children's ability then to learn in more and more environments. So that was one huge uh, piece of science that has influenced me and the field of intervention. The second one is the idea of how much could be changed. At the time that I was started working in this field, the, there was the idea that intellectual disability was a part of autism for most children and that the intellectual ability was a stable part of ASD. The, early, the longitudinal studies in the 1990s demonstrated very little IQ change from age 2 to age 13 and that the IQs were in the range of intellectual disability inside the typical group of children with ASD. The study that I'm sure you all know by Ivar Lovas in 1987 completely changed that idea about autism. He demonstrated that when we delivered intensive intervention one-on-one -on -one to young children with autism beginning really as soon as they were diagnosed by age two or at least by age three, and we did this for a long time, we could absolutely change the profile of that. And here you see the, um, the basic findings from that study that demonstrated that children who were not receiving this intensive one-on-one -on -one intervention, um, these were not randomized children. They uh, acquired less than 10 IQ uh, gain points across their entire li uh, learning lives from age two and a half to age 13, even though these were children in intervention during the time when intervention was required. Whereas children who were being treated with Lovas's method had massive changes in their IQ function uh, over time, they acquired um, 30, 20 to 30 IQ points and they're functioning both at age six to seven and age 13 was outside of the range of intellectual disability, inside the range of typical development. And so to me as a young researcher, this absolutely set the mark for what I thought could be accomplished and what uh, my goal was, which is to support typical cognitive and linguistic development in young children with autism in terms of their rate of learning as well as the sequence. Now it's interesting, I think, to, to think about using IQ and language learning as outcome measures because those aren't the things that define ASD, are they? The things that define ASD are social communication problems, theory of mind problems, executive function, these kind of more refined differences that we write about. However, if you look at the literature about what predicts adult 
outcomes and adult functioning in people with autism. Study after study after study over the last 30 years demonstrates that in fact it is these more typical areas of function like language ability and overall IQ as well as joint attention skills that predict from, this is from before age five, these skills pretty equally predict adult function um, in people with ASD and these three are all highly correlated. These are not three different abilities. These are coming from the deep well of general developmental ability. And so I think this has also had a tremendous influence on the interventions, which is go, you know, uh, really focus on language, on learning rates, and on social communication in order to accomplish these better outcomes. And so from that, the first phase of my uh, research focused on developing models of intervention that could, uh, that focused on these areas and that could have effect, big effects on cognitive function over time. And you may well know of the work I've done with Jerry Dawson on the Early Start Denver model, which is our current best effort to develop an effective treatment. It uses the science of development as well as the science of learning to construct both the content and the process of how children are taught. And um, this is a comprehensive intervention dealing with all areas which are affected, which as David pointed out, are many, many areas in autism. Um, using a typical model of infant and toddler development means that the quality of relationships are important, that focusing on the routines of everyday life is the, is the way in which most infants most readily learn, using natural kinds of interactions in which infant and toddler interests and preferences guide people in their responses to creating learning opportunities for them, um, and providing systematic uh, manuals of instruction so that teachers and parents and interventionists have a system for doing this while creating a completely individualized approach that can meet each child's interests and strengths and needs and style of learning. That's what we tried to develop in the Early Start Denver model. And our first outcome based on a randomized controlled trial I have Lovas' slide up here just to demonstrate that our 2010 paper demonstrated very similar effects to Lovas'. In two years, not three or four, of 15 hours a week of intervention, not 40, our uh, children who were randomized to early start Denver model also moved out of the intellectual disability range, an average IQ of 80, by the time they were uh, just turning four, whereas the comparison group only gained about five IQ points in the same period and were all in intervention as well, demonstrated that we were well on the road to being able to replicate this finding of Lovas, but with a very different approach and a much less expensive approach to the intervention. Jerry's paper in 2012 also demonstrated clearly that these are not surface area changes, but that we were changing bare basic responses of the brain. She demonstrated that young children getting this treatment showed very different responses to video pictures, just photographs of people versus objects, that their brains of the children who received ESDM responded like those of typically developing children, showing rapid uh, orientation to people that was stronger than to objects, even their favorite toys, and it showed this automatic bias towards social attention and social preference, which was the opposite of the children with ASD who did not receive this intervention and showed a clear and automatic uh, prefer, pref, preferential response to toys versus people. So we continue to work on, um, we've had several replications of the intervention now with groups in Australia, in Italy, we're finishing up a multi-site study of the ESDM as well, so that uh, that phase, it feels like we did complete that. And the second phase then was to put this in the hands of the community. I'm, we're in that phase right now, and our first focus was on putting this in the hands of parents, who are of course the uh, young children's first and most critical teachers, and children's most critical teachers um, forever. 
And so Lori Vismara and I teamed up in 2006 and have been working together ever since to focus on how to get these interventions into the hands of parents. We developed a manual specifically for parents that gives them a step-by-step, -step, kind of day-by-day -day way of uh, taking Early Start Denver model and doing it at home themselves. And we also demonstrated in a series of studies that parents could learn this intervention. This shows you parent learning graphs in which parents at the end of 12 sessions, 12 weeks, are basically at a therapist level of skill in the use of their Early Start Denver model techniques and show steady learning across the 12 weeks um, that paralleled their children's learning. So we have been studying how to teach this efficiently and quickly to parents and what kind of effects it can have on children. In order to get this into the public, into the hands of parents and community members, it means we have to put materials out there. And so we've published everything that we've written basically is available to the public. Our treatment manuals are available. Our curriculum is available. Uh, we've published the results in papers. We have courses online for anybody who wants to take them that goes through detail on how to do the Early Start Denver model. We provide supervision to people who want it. We have a credentialing process to help uh, professionals become uh, fluent in the Early Start Denver model skills and to protect parents uh, so that they have a way of making sure that people who say they're trained in this technique actually do. And, um, all of our videos and many, many of our teaching protocols are online free to families and, and professionals and anyone else who writes us and asks. So getting materials to the public is a huge part of putting ESDM in family hands. We've demonstrated that parents, as parents uh, practice and develop these skills, children's development is accelerating both in their learning rates and in the reduction of their autism symptoms. And that paper is currently about to be submitted. And then finally, I want to turn to our last, um, our last phase because I know my time is up. And I feel like now that we've been able to demonstrate that parents can learn these and can make changes in their children's development, we've got to figure out how to get these interventions into the hands of more families and children. And so uh, I've been staying working on a project which is focused on low resource children um, who do not receive intervention or diagnosis anywhere near the same timeline that children with more means do and to get increased access to early intervention specific help right into parents' hands. And so we've developed the community ESDM which we're now testing in low resource communities across the country. We've developed web and video based materials that go right to families to their smartphones, which uh, don't require any reading skills or um, any particular fluencies. We have these short little video lessons that take parents through the same, same steps that the manuals do. The program is called Help is in Your Hands, and we have 20 little video lessons for parents that um, focus on how to use these techniques in their everyday routines at home. And we also have developed a set of materials, video, and website for their interventionists, which provide them with autism-specific information and help them coach parents, even if they have no background at all in ASD. So overall, the work in my lab is trying to focus on meeting children's and parents' needs by providing interventions directly into parents' hands as well as into their providers' hands so that young children with autism and their families can have effective interventions that are low cost and low intensity to deliver, to teach, and to supervise, and also to uh, develop interventions that come through community hands so that they can resonate with local values practices and resources. We've found that our, our tools are already in the hands of families in South Africa, in India, and in China. We get emails daily from across the world from families who found our books, found our videos, and are implementing their, their, these interventions without any other help and are feeling very, very happy with what they're seeing. So this is the work of my lab. Thank you very much for your attention and I apologize for running over. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. I do have a question for you. 
are there certain types of kids who seem more responsive to your intervention than others? Um, in other words, what kids succeed and which ones don't? I, I'm glad you asked that question because in my mind, uh, succeeding intervention in an intervention means children are learning. And I have yet to meet a child who does not learn and make progress on their objectives. Certainly children learn at different rates. Um, but I, um, children learn in these interventions. Every child we have treated makes progress on their objectives. And that's partly because we can individualize inside these protocols so that we can meet children where they are and teach them what they're ready to learn. Um, and, and so I feel like that's the answer. Children learn and children learn inside this model. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Um, this is Jill again. I need to bow out pretty soon, but we are going to turn it over to Dr. Vanderwater. And um, again, Christina, our co-host, will be handling any questions at the end of Dr. Vanderwater's presentation. So if you have questions for any of today's panelists, feel free to type them into the question bar. Um, and if I can ask our presenters, except Dr. Vanderwater, to put yourselves on mute. Um, that would be very helpful to control some echo. Okay, so um, Dr. Vanderwater, are you there? I am. Okay, take it away. Great, thanks. So I'm, I'm honored to be presenting with my distinguished colleagues and, and as you'll see from my slides, we actually, many of them have participated in the studies, actually all of them have in the studies I'm gonna present. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna talk to you about some work we're doing in, in what's going on in the gestational environment. So what's going on during pregnancy that may contribute to having a child with autism. And this is work that I do in collaboration with Irva as part of the CHARGE study. Um, Christine has contributed to this, some work that we've done together, and, and Sally Rogers in, in terms of behavior, and David Emerald as well in terms of imaging and, and um, <clears throat> some of the samples that we've used. So. It is, I'm glad to be able to, to back clean up here and give the last presentation. So as we, we've learned, there are many suspected causes and, and I just, this pie chart is a very simplistic um, graphic to describing that, but we know that there are genetic, um, certain genetic gene, single gene disorders and, and uh, CMVs and other identified susceptibility genes, but as we've, as um, was stated previously, we're in the thousands in dealing with some of the um, candidate genes for that. And so we, we also, we want to look at what the sort of, uh, what's in this unknown piece of the pie <clears throat> in terms of, of autism that doesn't, that doesn't come from a single gene disorder like Fragile X or Rett's. And part of this is what we're working on in, in maternal autoantibodies. And, and this accounts for about 23% um, of this pie and actually maybe a little bit more now that we've discovered um, another autoantibody. But I'm just going to talk about sort of where we are right now. Um, but to give you some background of what I mean by this is some women develop antibodies and we don't know why. We have no idea what the cause is of this. We don't know when they develop. Um, but they do make antibodies to, or what we call autoantibodies to their own proteins. And um, during gestation, Autoantibodies cross the placenta to protect the fetus, so they they the, they have access to the fetus beginning about day 100 of pregnancy, um, and this is normal. This protects the fetus um, from everything the mom has been exposed to. But unfortunately, when in the mix of these protective IgG antibodies, there are antibodies that are recognizing self proteins or autoantibodies they can uh, bind, find and bind to their target. And if they happen to recognize targets in the developing brain, they then can bind to those targets. And so it could be anywhere, it could be on a neuron, it could be supporting tissue, but what we do know is that um, these antibodies do get into the developing brain. And this can then lead to changes in how neurons develop, and that's what I'm going to talk about very briefly today, give you an overview of this. This, as I said, is, accounts for about potentially tw up to 23% of cases with autism, um, of children with autism. Ha mothers have these autoantibodies. They're incredibly specific. Uh, as a matter of fact, we very, very rarely see um, the mother of a typically developing child with this, these um, specific patterns of autoantibodies. 
it is a dis it is really sort of a distinct group. These um, children tend to have they have more severe behaviors, uh, especially more pronounced stereotypic behavior, and um, they have in a study that. Um, an early study that we did with Christine, we see significantly larger brain volume, especially in boys um, whose mothers have these autoantibodies, and I'll show you some of those data, but we've also replicated that in, in now uh, three different animal models. But one thing um, to remember is that these children do not have deficits in cognitive function or um, executive function, meaning they have normal or, if, if anything, high IQ. Um, and we do not see in our animal models any um, deficits or, or um, decrease in memory or cognition as well. So um, just to give you some background, all, this, all of this work began with observation of, of this pattern up here in this western ball. This is where we took um, brain from a um, fetal brain from a developing monkey and um, ran it in a gel and probed it with plasma from a mother, from a set of mothers either who had children with autism, whose children were typically developing, or whose children had developmental delay without autism. And what we noticed was whenever we saw this pairing of bands, it happened to be the mother of a child with autism. And sometimes we would see the bands individually, and, and those were increased in this population, but not necessarily specific for that population. And this um, was also found by another researcher, Harvey Singer and um, Andy Zimmerman with, at Johns Hopkins, um, subsequent to ours, our finding, which was good. So this was replicated by another group. As I mentioned, these autoantibodies are associated <clears throat> with language deficits and stereotypic behavior. And in the very first paper, we saw a higher um, number of children who had uh, regressive autism at that time. I think we've sort of redefined things now. so. Um, we'll have to revisit that aspect, but um, we do see the more severe language deficits and increased stereotypic behavior. In looking for what potential genetics, you know, susceptibility uh, genes that we could um, find in this population, we did see in work with Dan Campbell and Pat Levitt an increase in um, the CMET genetic variant associated with the production of these autoantibodies. I'm not going to go into that further, but um, that work was done by one of my graduate students. And so what that told us was that the met having the mo mother having this variant did not cause autism because there were plenty of women who had it, um, whose ch children were typically developing, but all but one of the mothers ha who had the autoantibodies had this variation. So that makes it a, a susceptibility factor or a susceptibility gene, not a causal gene. Other risk factors in work with Irva and, and her group um, that we've seen are these autoantibodies were associated with metabolic conditions in the mother, and that would include um, uh, gestational diabetes um, and high blood pressure and sort of everything that we associate with metabolic syndrome. Um, and so this the question is, you know, what the relationship is, we don't know yet, but that was that was an epidemiologic finding that we thought was interesting. And metabolic conditions are often associated with inflammation, as are is the production of autoantibodies. In several MRI studies now, that um, one in children that we did with um, uh, Christine, and then um, also in monkeys, and more most recently in mice, um, we've seen a large brain volume. Uh, so this is the developing brain, and I'll show a graphic of that as Christine talked about, the changes in how the brain develops and, and the developmental trajectory in terms of total cerebral volume. Um, we're seeing the same thing in, in our models that I'm going to describe to you in a minute. There are now, we know there are eight antigenic targets, meaning these are the targets that these auto, the proteins that these autoantibodies recognize. And a group in um, New York has also found autoantibodies and has identified a target um, that is different from what we've got here. So that's good. We've got um, another group working on this as well. Um, and we have several animal models. One of the ways to really determine if an autoantibody is causative versus just a good biomarker of a disease or disorder is to put that antibody, just transfer 
that antibody into a, an animal that doesn't have the antibodies on board and see if there's an effect. And that's one of the first ways we test that. And we've now done that with two um, passive transfer, meaning we took human IgG, human antibody, and put it into a monkey um, in two different studies. We have five, uh, and there are five mouse studies showing behavior changes after the um, the female mice are exposed to these antibodies, the dams, the, the mothers carrying the um, fetuses are exposed to these during pregnancy. <clears throat> and so each of these studies has shown both changes in brain structure and um, in the uh, behavior of the offspring. And then we've looked at brain tissues to see what the effect of these antibodies are on brain tissues and have demonstrated some pathology or changes in the brain that I'm going to show you in a minute. So, so I thought I would include this because um, Christine has already, um, she presented such a great presentation uh, prior to mine on the abnormal brain enlargement in children with autism. And in this graph, this is the group that, um, these are all males here in this, in this particular study, but that you see quite a range, but that children with uh, males with autism have a larger total cerebral volume at, at this time point than do the typically developing children. And, and this is significantly um, higher in this population. But if you look in the middle here, in the middle graph is really is the group of boys whose mothers have these autoantibodies. And they are significantly, they have significantly larger brain, total brain volume than either the ASD um, population without the antibodies or the typically de um, developing children, mothers of uh, typically developing children who don't have any of these antibodies. So this is sort of a, a distinctive subgroup of these, and it tells us that these antibodies actually are changing the way the brain develops and that we can actually measure that using MRI. So we identified the protein targets that these, so remember this is the first graphic I showed, was these, this is, we went from this where it was this very um, sort of a non-specific, this pattern was specific, but not a very definitive way of looking at it. And that turned out to be antibodies to uh, LDH, CRIMP1, and STIP1, and I'm not going to go into what those are, but these are all the seven proteins that we have now <clears throat> associated with these autoantibodies. <clears throat> and it's really, um, each, of one, each one of them has a different role in how a neuron develops. And um, from the very early uh, neurite outgrowth all, all the way out to its development of um, the axon and, and growth cone collapse. And, and the effect of these antibodies is additive, meaning if you have an antibody to just one of those proteins, it doesn't have appear to have much of an effect. However, it's when you have them in combination, meaning you're impacting more than one um, point along the development of a neuron that you then see uh, the effect of these antibodies. So as I mentioned, we have anim done several animal models trying to understand what, if any, effect these antibodies have. And if we take the human antibody and we put it into a gestating female and wait until the um, offspring are born, then we, we've noticed that we see changes in behavior. And um, Melissa Bauman in work that um, we did with uh, Melissa and David here, we noticed that the offspring displayed inappropriate approach behavior to unfamiliar peers, and that the male um, IgG ASD treated offspring had enlarged brain volume, similar to what we see in humans. In a mouse model where we injected the antibodies directly into the ventricles of the brain, we also saw that the offspring had increased stereotypic behaviors and altered social phenotypes. And this is just a graph of the growth trajectory. This is the those animals that were treated with the human IgG that recognized these autoantigens, and this is these are control animals that had IgG that didn't have this reactivity. So over time, beginning at one week to 24 months to up to two years, we saw this accelerated brain size. In a subsequent set of studies, in parallel, when we injected the labeled antibody into um, the mouse brain, we saw significant changes in how the neurons 
grew and developed and divided and migrated into the brain through the brain. Um, so, and we did note that these autoantibodies get into these developing neurons. So they actually go inside the cell. So this is a brain that was treated with the MAR antibody. <clears throat> so it was injected here and allowed to sit for two hours. And then we took the brain and stained them. And this is a control. This, this was given IgG from a control um, from a woman whose child was typically developing. And you can see there's, there's no staining <clears throat> of this brain at all. And so these are the cells, these are developing radioglial stem cells coming off, developing here. And you can see they've taken this, all the brown shows where they've taken up these antibodies. And this, these antibodies are getting inside cells. And this is rather a novel finding in autoimmunity. We've always just assumed that autoantibodies are too big to get inside cells. They can't get into the intracellular targets and that they, they wouldn't have an effect um, against intracellular targets. And we now know from these studies that they actually do get inside the neuron and, and can change how those neurons are migrating. So they're migrating faster and they're, they're more rapidly dividing. And this is again treated, I thought we had messed up this experiment that we hadn't labeled our IgG and, we, and it was labeled, it just doesn't stay in the inside the cell and bind to the targets the way the um, MAR ASD IgG does. So that was a really, really brief overview. We've got um, our newest, um, we, I think importantly that we have data that supports that um, maternal um, autoantibody related um, autoantibodies are a contributor to a subtype of autism. That the gestational immune dysregulation, which is a fancy way of saying when the immune system of the mother goes awry during pregnancy, could contribute to risk of altered neurodevelopment. <clears throat> we have there is a number of studies suggesting this now beyond the autoantibodies. Um, we know that antibodies localized to the brain of the developing animal in um, monkey and rodent because we've actually now done imaging studies of that. And the newest, our newest mouse model, <clears throat> where we created the antibodies in the mouse, in, and I didn't show those data because we don't have a lot of time here, but um, show that they actually, we hit all three domains. We have profound social deficits, um, verbal in a mouse in terms of a male, when an estrus, a female that's in heat or an estrus female is put in with a male, they have very little, if any, verbal communication at all. They make very little ultrasonic vocalizations in, in that situation when they've been exposed to the, uh, when the dams have produced these antibodies. And stereotypic behaviors were profoundly increased in these animals. So we, we are very excited about this new model. And we think that these data demonstrate that MAR autoantibodies actually can change neurodevelopment, supporting both the rationale for these as a potential biomarker of risk of having a child with autism in the future, we hope, but also a way of understanding one potential mechanism um, in, in autism spectrum disorders. We still need to determine which pattern of these autoantibodies are actually responsible for changing the way neurons develop, and we would like to develop therapeutic strategies in the future. And I do not do this work on my own. It's a huge compilation of individuals that help um, with this. Most notably, Dr. Karen Jones, who's sitting right there, did all the animal behavior for our mice. And um, Melissa Bauman and, and David Amaral with the monkeys. And so, and certainly we cannot do this without the families that help us um, support this research. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vanderwater. We do have a few minutes for questions, and I have some queued up. The first one is for Dr. Nordahl. How is the brain folding different in autistic people compared to the neurotypical brain? Sorry, I was just trying to figure out how to unmute here. Um, 
We have done several studies and we're currently working on one where we found regional differences. So in specific regions, the one region that we've identified in young children is the fusiform gyrus, which is involved in face processing. But I like to think about the differences in the cortical folding as potentially giving us a window into when these uh, alterations might be happening. So we know that the brain, the process of cortical folding is happening in utero during pregnancy. And the way I think about it is, uh, in addition to looking at the different regions that may be impacted by these differences in folding, we can also look at the timing of when uh, perhaps different environmental insults are happening, um, looking at, because we know the specific pattern of when these uh, folding patterns are developing, if that makes any sense. So the fusiform gyrus is one region where we've seen differences in young kids, but we think uh, in a previous study we've looked at, we've seen differences in the frontal lobe as well, the parietal operculum, various brain regions, and these do seem like they're associated with some of the behavioral deficits that we're seeing in autism. And of course, the, the big thing is that everything we see in boys, we don't see in girls. <laughs> everything is, seems to be different in girls uh, with autism. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Rogers. When is the CESDM available for everyone and how can families access the material and videos? Um, can you hear me, Jill? Yes, this can is you? Christine. Yes, we can hear you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Christine. The C we are piloting the CESDM materials now and we will be running a randomized controlled trial in the next year. Uh, we will not have those particular materials available until we've made sure that they're effective. However, the other things that we have, um, videos, manuals, things on our website, those are uh, freely available to parents. All they have to do is write to ESDM training at um, ucdmc.ucdavis.edu. That's ESDM training at cdmc.ucdavis.edu and request access to the videos and training materials and people can have them. Great, thank you. I have a question for Dr. Hertz Pachotto. The question is, air pollution was so much worse in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and autism was rare. The spike in autism began in the 80s after the air became considerably cleaner. So why then would air pollution be suspect? Okay, this is a really good question, um, <clears throat> and it speaks to how we think about the the whole world of causes out there. So first of all, um, we and, and it's a similar thing about the the folic acids. It seems like more people are taking uh, the folic acid prenatal supplements now, but the 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 the, the causes for the rise and the causes for autism in general. Um, are not necessarily going to be the same causes. So, for example, if we find, and we did, uh, that about half of the rise uh, was, was not a true rise, then <clears throat> about half of the, that, that rise is due to, is actually people who did have aut autism spectrum disorder but were not diagnosed. So, that we have to explain not only an increase but the background, both the <clears throat> the background that was being diagnosed all along, <clears throat> and what might be even a larger background, which is the people who were not being diagnosed all along, even though they actually did have uh, the all of the symptoms that would have qualified them today uh, as as having autism. And so, uh, we would expect that there would be some factors that have been around all along, and and some factors that are decreasing when there may be cofactors that make those, uh, let's say, the air pollution impacts even greater um, <clears throat> than, than they would be by themselves. Uh, also, <clears throat> the nature of our air pollution has changed to some extent <clears throat> so that uh, the kinds of things that are in the fuels and that are being emitted uh, include some chemicals that maybe uh, weren't, uh, weren't being emitted in, in, in some of the older fuels. Thank you. Um, next question is for Dr. Rogers. What do you recommend in terms of intervention for older children and young adults who did not benefit from ABA or other early interventions and remain severely impaired? 
Um, for older, well, I think as soon as children leave the early childhood period, you know, there um, our interventions need to focus on specific skills that people need to get along in the environments that they're living in. And that includes school environments for kids who are in school, home, recreation, all the environments that families want their children to be in. And the intervent the learning science, you know, we all learn pretty much the same way in terms of exposures, repetitions, being able to plan our actions in response to whatever the stimulus is and carrying things forward. Uh, and being able to see the effects of our actions and having those positive effects over time kind of help us consolidate the motor patterns and the behavior patterns that we need to carry out whatever whatever it is we're doing, whether we're talking about communicating or shopping or doing laundry or doing work tasks or writing our names. So it's the approach, the learning approach is not so different in terms of how we set it up. It's about what specific somebody needs to learn, what's getting in their way in terms of not having the skills need for what environment, what people, what activities, and getting very prescriptive about that. Um, there are all kinds of studies in the literature as, in terms of teaching people to, you know, it's, it's incredible what you can read, how to teach to ride two-wheel bicycles, how to teach young adults to purchase things or fold laundry or do complex work tasks, use computers, touch screens, et cetera. But the basic tools are the learning science tools that, that um, applied behavior analysis and education use. It's the kind of identifying what the problem is, what's getting in the way of the young person's functioning in that environment, and then thinking about what would be a more useful skill for them that helps them reach their own goals in this environment. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question, and this is for Dr. Nordahl. Can you explain more about the brain differences between male and female autism brains? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it, it's hard, you know, it, when you think about brain differences, we can think about it in many different ways. and. Um, some people will compare males with autism to females with autism. Our approach is to compare within sex. So we look at males with autism versus um, males with typical development, females with autism versus females with typical development. Did I say that right? Um, and, and we look for different patterns. And so there's three general patterns that are emerging without getting into the specifics of the brain regions. One is um, where we see, we do see in some of our different analyses some overlap in the brain regions that are altered, which definitely makes sense. But we also see some unique regions that we are only seeing in the females or only in the males. And these unique regions tend to be the regions that are also most different between typically developed developing males and typically developing females. And those are the regions that I'm looking at as potentially those protective regions, um, regions that could be, have been adapting all along in some way before that basket of rocks got too big for the girls. We think that there must be some adaptive brain regions as well. So that's one way that we're looking at, at the pattern of sex differences in autism. Um, another way is to look at how close uh, the patterns are to either sex's typical development. So we can look at how close are uh, females with autism to females with typical development versus males with typical development and look at the, the patterns there. So there's lots of different ways to, to go into sex differences and how we look at them. And I could take a whole hour talking about them, but I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much. So I think this wraps it up for today. I want to thank our panel uh, for uh, providing us with these wonderful presentations today and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, this will be posted in the next day or so on the website and you can use the link that you used to register and attend the, um, the webinar um, in order to go back and watch it again. And that can be found on the Autism Society website. Um, thank you so much and um, we will be back in the fall with um, more webinars. Thank <laughs> you.